You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. I think we have to make our own destinies. We have opportunities. We can meet the moment or not meet the moment. We can choose. I think it's, there's like a karmic pattern to your life, and you can succumb to it or embrace it or also try and overcome it. <laughs> Welcome to a very special episode. This episode is special, super special, super flurry, super special. I tried to alliterate for at least two reasons. First, this is a very special crossover episode between Was It Chance and my personal podcast, The Theater Podcast with Alan Seals. And it's my first ever repeat guest. This guest is so special to me. He needs to get more than one episode in more than one place. And it's now a drinking game. Everybody take a shot when you hear Alan say the word special. <laughs> <laughs> so go back to episode 71 of the theater podcast to get the first episode with Steven Sater, our guest today. So without further ado, here is the standard Was It Chance intro. Go ahead, Heather. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals, super Alan Seals. <laughs> and we're two perfect strangers who met by chance and embraced opportunity. Listen in as we chat with other successful super people about the risks they've taken. <laughs> Almost made me spit Alan my show. coffee. <laughs> About the risks they've taken to put themselves on a path to creative success. We are so totes excited to welcome our guest. Super, super totes excited. We are super superlatively <laughs> totes excited to welcome our guest, Stephen Sater. And now Heather's going to read his bio. <laughs> oh, thanks for setting that up. That We needed that set up. <laughs> Stephen is currently joining us from London, uh, and we have really appreciated it. It's been a, a work of art to get in the same room together to do this interview. He just opened up his revival production of Spring Awakening, the show which garnered him two Tony Awards, an Olivier Award, and a Grammy Award win. All of those were wins, not just nominations, <laughs> wins. He's also penned a whole slew of shows, including one of my personal favorites and one of Alan's personal favorites, Alice by Heart, which was then turned into Alice by Heart, the novel, which was released last year, 2020, right? Yep. I don't know when you're listening to this. <laughs> it was released <laughs> in 2020. 2020. His latest work of genius is a full-length concept album called Some Lovers, and it's a project that he co-wrote with artistic legend Burt Bacharach, and it's now Grammy-nominated. Holy hell, this is a resume. <laughs> and available everywhere that you can find music. Wow. Steven Sater, welcome to the Was It Chance and also back to the theater. What the hell is your podcast name, Alan? The Theater Podcast. The theater Heather, podcast. <laughs> how long have we been doing this? Okay. I'm Hi, Stephen, how the hell are you? I think this is really chance, Heather, that we're meeting. And the chance is that Alan and I hit it off. And so when we when we did our podcast about the Alice by Heart book, and so I was cheeky enough to ask him if I could have a return visit as his first return guest because I, I love, love talking that. to him so much and being around <laughs> Talk him. about creative intention. So, this is the beautiful chance of this in some way. Like so much of where you are it is due to your friendship and your collaboration with with so many people, including Duncan Sheik, which of course is created uh, Spring Awakening with you. And now Some Lovers is this amazing new concept album that you, again, by chance, right? You no. started collaborating with Burt Bacharach to now make this this Grammy nomination out there in the world. Like, how did Tell this happen? Us. It, it yeah. wasn't entirely by chance. I mean, it was by miracle and design, but but I, um, <laughs> what happened was when um, Spring Awakening was sort of at its zenith, um, it was the, one of the only times in my life in which I had good timing. Spring Awakening was doing really well, and um, my, my music publishing deal had run out. And the music publisher is the, are the people who look after your rights as a, as a songwriter. 
it just so happened I was meeting the CEOs of these companies rather than, you know, the people I would normally meet because of that moment in my life. And meeting after meeting, they would say to me, so you have your great relationship with Duncan. What other composers can we introduce you to? And I drew a blank. And then I said, well, Burt Backrack, because this is my favorite composer and I grew up loving him. In every single meeting, they said, oh, Burt is great. And who else? And then in one meeting, they said, um, oh, we've had Bert's guy here for 20 years. And a week later, I was invited to a luncheon with Bert's guy. And a few days after that, Bert called me. And his daughter was a fan of Spring Awakening. So he, so he knew about it through her. And we met and we had this remarkable first meeting. I asked him about his first gig working as Marlena Dietrich's, you know, music as her conductor, really. And um, I was getting up to leave, and he said, um, "Yeah, and I, and I overstayed. I'd stayed a long time, and it was it was great." I was leaving, and he said, "Well, it sounds like you have your partner for the theater, but if you ever have a lyric sometime, you want to show me." And I said, "I brought one." And so I reached into my backpack and pulled out this lyric and gave it to her. Brilliant. Bert. And he was, he was walking me up the hall to the door. And he looked at it. It's called Ready to be Done with You. And he read the title. And then he was glancing at it. And then he slumped against the wall and started. And, he, and then he just turned without saying anything and walked back into the room we'd been in. And I followed him in. And he sat down in a chair. And he started reading the lyric aloud. And he read the entire lyric back to me with interjections like, oh, this is so real, man. Oh, who hasn't felt this, Stevie? I mean, I was speechless. We sat there and then um, he walked me out and uh, he was going to Australia to conduct his first ever, the first time ever he'd written a symphony. So I did, I, and I left thinking, well, that was my meeting with Burt Backrack. wow. And uh, about five weeks later, my phone rang and he said it was Burt. And he said he had a little something for the lyric I had given him. Did I want to hear it? And I said, yeah, it would be great to hear it. So then I came back to his house. And this time I was ushered into the piano room, which is a spectacular white room. with it. And indeed, it was the shelves of Grammys and Academy Awards and all of it. I sat next to him at the piano. And he had the physical copy of the lyric I'd given him. And he had written bars of music across it. He had set the wow. lyric verbatim. It was a three-page lyric. He said it without changing a wow. syllable. That's and so somehow cool. he had transformed it into a back rack song. When we got, I was, I was blown away. And um, there are more stories in that. But as we got up to leave, I said, I couldn't even say a thing. And then I finally said, this is so beautiful, Bert. And he said, our first one should be a great one. Wow. So I got this signal. I said, if you ever have another lyric. And I said, I brought one. And so that was, that was how it got started. <laughs> just keep those in your pocket <laughs> yeah yeah i I'm, it, i mean it's a huge emotional enormous momentous event in my life to work with him to know him to call him my partner he's the most loving man no one has called me more often wow. over this pandemic to see how i've been doing how i've been feeling how my mental health is He's, he's really been a remarkable partner. So yes, mm. there's many stories and I'm talking endlessly, but um, about the conception of this, it's a show. There's, it's a musical, it's a new musical called Some Lovers. And the pandemic right. hit and we thought we could create, we could bring theater to people in their homes through creating the concept album. That is so cool. How did the whole process come to be? Because you, you have this one song, obviously he, from the beginning, he knew he was going to work with you for multiple songs. And then at what point did you decide to turn this into uh, a full, a full length show? And I haven't even gotten into the, the people who are featured singing on this show yet. It's a list of who's who in theater right now. We were writing songs. Bert said to me on that same day, that as we were leaving, he said, love songs. That's what I write, love songs. So I had, was giving him lyrics that were love songs. And at a certain point, I came to recognize, because always in, in this collaboration of the show, all the songs were written, the lyrics were first, and then he set them to music. And I came to recognize that... Um, None of the lyrics was what, what we think of as the traditional love song or pop love song of I'm young, I'm falling in love, she's so hot, she broke my heart, whatever it is. They were all like mid-relationship 
disaffection, regret, renewed hope, yearning, you know, redetermination. One day something happened. We had a discouraging episode with an artist who was going we're going to record one of the songs and then couldn't and Bert was upset and we weren't working for a while and I came to his house for lunch and we were sitting at the kitchen counter and he said, um, you know, Stevie, I had a dream last night that we just rented a theater and played our songs. And I reeled back and said, that's what we're going to do. And so I thought we could take our songs wow. and create a musical. So it was almost like crafting a jukebox musical out of your own songs. And because all these songs then I recognized were this kind of mid-relationship disaffection, I, re I thought of, the, and it was near, it was July and we were working on a Christmas song in the sweltering heat of L.A. And I th remember that Christmas fable of O. Henry, the gift of the Magi, where the two young people, come, she cuts off her hair and he sells his watch and they make the greatest sacrifices for love for each other. And I thought, what happens to those people 15 years later after you've sacrificed everything for someone? How do you live with that? What happens in the relationship? And so that was the basis of beginning wow. work on the show. That's so cool. And I, I, that speaks to so many people because there there are, I think, probably countless people who may admit, but probably don't want to, that they've given up a part of their of who they are, yeah. of who their identity is, to try to make something work, to take a chance and make something work in a relationship that ultimately in the back of their head, they know is a waste of time. Nothing's a waste of time. I think that's the point, right? Is we always learn something. We always take something forward with us. I guess if you're if you're doing it from a constructive standpoint, yeah, yeah, I, I can agree with that. Stephen, this is not your first chance encounter. Like it feels like from from my listening of your first interview with Alan, from the time you were very small, chance played a really powerful role in guiding your life. There's no doubt about it. Basically, it's like you're not afraid to embrace to embrace fear and take a chance. Like that's just a personality trait. Yeah, I'm not I'm not buckled by adversity. I, ju I guess maybe because I grew up and you know this, Alan, that I was always so ill as a child and I was, you know, in an oxygen tent and all that. I, I think there was part of me that was going to make the most of what I could. And then when I had my accident in college, and maybe this was my nature anyway, I don't want to just set it on events, but I had this terrible accident where I was trapped in a fire and had to, you know, I was on fire, had to jump to get free. And I was laid up in a hospital for a very long time. And I just determined so hard that I would make a dent in the world, that I would live, that I would write things that could impact other people and somehow become a part of the world. So I, I think um, no one likes adverse circumstance. You know, no one likes rejection. No one likes the environment telling them no. But I guess I've been willing to just suck it up and push on and keep going. I mean, this musical Some Lovers is a great, great example. Um, we premiered it. It was too early. We didn't have the right creative team. The show was not right. It was not ready. It took years um, to get it going again. I kept rewriting the book. Bert, Bert was game. We rewrote new songs. We had a concert at Lincoln Center in 2016 that was great. And then we got a production, you know, a workshop production in London. I just never stopped fighting for it. That's what I want to say. You know, then we, we went to the Adirondack Theater Festival, new director. We did all this tremendous amount of work. And the pandemic, we were, so we were looking to like book, it was, we have a producer. We thought we were going to a tour of certain regional theaters and potentially coming in for a limited run on Broadway. And the pandemic hit as it hit so many people and everything shut mm -hmm. down. And I just thought we have to do this. Ert is 93. This music is part of his legacy. Wow. This is his first time writing a new musical since Promises, Promises in 1968. We can't let this sit. We can't let this go. Wow. And so we undertook to create this concept album. That's incredible. Van Dean at Broadway Records said he would release it. And then he it said, what is your concept? We had no concept. So I said, it just came up with it on the spot. <laughs> it was like, Broadway lovers sing some lovers. This goes to your question earlier 
um, Heather, about the cast we pulled together. I, I thought, okay, let's get great classic couples to sing our score. And my first call, it was text, and then it became call, was with John, you know, Jonathan Groff and Liam Michelle. And they said, yes. Then we began okay. one after the other recording people, and it was almost entirely remotely. It was so difficult. Lily Cooper had been able to come into a studio. We recorded her vocal. Ethan Slater said yes, he would record with her. We had to record, we recorded him on Zoom. He was in his closet. We had an hour and a half of complete Zoom audio issues. He had to keep singing the opening line of the song over and over and over again. I can't tell you, it was like, had to be 200 lines <laughs> and the first 200 times. And the first line was, and so we're just starting out, aren't we? And he kept singing it so sincerely. And I thought if I point this out, we'll never get through this. So I had to just suppress my laughter every time he sang it. It was really challenging. We wanted to release the album in in time to meet the Grammys, it seemed impossible. We had like five artists still to record. Somehow we pulled together four of them. Ramin Karamlu was in quarantine in Korea and he was flying to New York to begin a show and it was the last possible day. The album had to be turned in to be mixed. And I was in LA and I we were flying into New York. I flew in a day early to meet him and his show was canceled in New York. And he was, he rerouted to London. And I flew into Hurricane Ida. And so I was, I was huh. detained in Minneapolis. What? And it was insane. And so we begged and pleaded for another, I, I, it wasn't even a day. It was like, can we have 18 hours, whatever, 12 hours. He found people to come record him in his London flat. And I, my flight, of course, was again delayed. And so I came in to JFK and came running to a car, I had an Uber. And I was in the back seat on Zoom with this car driving like a mad person through traffic on the, on the you know, the, the, um, the highway, trying, <laughs> so motion sick, trying to like keep it going with Ramin to get this song recorded because the song really had to be turned in that day to master the album so it's just wow. incredible that we got this album done it's incredible and the fact that then we have res i'm going to start crying i won't stop myself i mean it's grammy nominated i i can't even believe that it's happened you and i have, have bonded over like the buddhist aspect yes. of our lives and 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 the I, I guess where i'm going with this is how much of of where you are now and with especially with this album especially after telling that story uh, how much of chance do you feel relates to ultimately fate, right? Like this was supposed to happen or do you feel like you're in control of everything or you just kind of go with it and whatever's meant to be kind of just gets put out there in the world? I definitely don't think you go with it and everything that's meant to be happens. I think we make what's meant to be. Yes. But I think there's a destiny. There's a larger destiny at play. No doubt about it. But I think we have to make our own destinies. We have opportunities in which we can rise or fall or not. We can meet the moment or not meet the moment. We, we can choose. It's not like disaster if you don't. But I, I think it's, there's like a karmic pattern to your life and you can succumb to it or, or you know, uh, um, embrace it or also try and overcome it, you know, in the moment you're in. And that was an opportunity where everything said, let this go. And um, to be quite frank, a lot of people around me were saying, we shouldn't try and meet this Grammy deadline, that there would be no time to promote the album because of the, we were moving towards such a quick release. And, and indeed, we, we, we got much less press than we might have gotten, particularly with all the artists, the stars we have on this record, because we, we turned the album in and it was released like two days later. I think it actually became available that day, you know, like like really soon. And then it, it wasn't even announced for a couple of days. So, yes, I think we we um, I think we have a real hand in our destiny. I think the blueprint for our happiness already exists within our lives, but it's hard to see it and it's hard to fulfill it. And that's the challenge we face to call up the wisdom to recognize the patterns of our own behavior and to make a difference. 
Yeah. Um, that's what I feel. Yeah. I mean, it's a, this, so much tenaciousness in that, right? Like where I'm all about leaning into the signs that the universe presents and the universe gave you all sorts of signs to stop. <laughs> like, don't keep going. But your yeah. heart, like you knew that you had to keep going. And so sometimes our intuition has to override. Uh, what was the reaction or the results? You got it in just on the deadline and then you got nominated what <laughs> what was the reaction to that total exhilaration and gratitude <laughs> and it felt like a prayer had been answered to be honest i determined to do this for bert that was my inner determination now i'm holding back tears again Bring i on um, the tears too. i wanted to, to do this for him and i also wanted to do it for our show yeah not just for him, but we were so invested in this show and we wanted to bring our show into the world. And we wanted, I wanted people to hear his music again. And to, you know, I, I, that's what I felt. I felt a responsibility to bring this into the world. And so I guess that drove me. I don't sleep as much as I should. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> was it, was it hard to get all of these people on the album? I mean, it, just some of the names, not all of them. Christy Altamir, Kristen Chenoweth. You mentioned Lily Cooper, of course, Santino Fontana's on it. Your friend Molly Gordon, who is in Alice by Heart. You mentioned Ramin. Jennifer Holiday, of all people. I mean, uh -huh. this is this is less Ashley Park. This is less than half the people that are on that are on the album right now. And what what is the chance that that they take in lending their names and their voices to something? That is, is completely unknown like this. Alan, it was pulling so many favors. That's what I thought. Yeah. And I'm actually not good at this. At, at good, I mean, maybe I am because I achieved it, but I'm not. I'm racked by it. The diff, you know, of asking someone to do this kind of thing. And we, and of course, they made very little money. And it, can you like find a Zoom? You know, can you record when you're on location for your film? It was crazy what we were asking people to do and to record this song for us. And they said yes. And it was hard. So Kristen Chenoweth, who said yes immediately, it was over two years before the song. Actually, we had we had to cancel. I don't know. I think five different recording dates, which wow. we had at various points. In fact, she was scheduled to come in. This is right as the pandemic was beginning. I was in L.A., whatever year it was that the pandemic began. Um, was it 2020, I guess? So I was in LA and I was in, in immersed in it as a TV project that we had been setting up. And we had this huge meeting, but Kristen was finally going to be able to record in New York. So I guess it's been, it was at least three years we were trying to record her because this was a year in. And I flew was flying to New York and she had to cancel that day she would you know there were real reasons why she had to cancel but so the fact that we finally were able to record her on zoom and bert was part of it we were in five different locations i think it's incredible as we were doing it with the location with the engineer and the producer she was in a studio i don't remember where she was it was incredible and it came together and it's so hard to produce anything especially music on zoom with lag with internet. i mean you, you know i can't imagine how much work had to go into producing something that was so spectacular that it is grammy nominated I, now it's a new drinking <laughs> game every time i say grammy nominated you can do a shot you'll be wasted by the time this interview is over <laughs> but i'll be happy <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Park and Conrad Ricamora, the fact that people said yes, I'll never get over it. I, and I'll never forget it. I have such a debt of gratitude to all these performers who are part of it. And I think they're all pleased with how it came out, with how they sound. They have to Santino be. Fontana said to me, um, oh, this is going to sound like he's throwing shit on other projects. I don't mean to do that. But he was saying, you know, I, they, my voice is mixed so well. My voice is never mixed well when I first hear it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, there you go. And I've been, I didn't even know Santino. Really? I had met him. Yeah, we I'd met him at, we both have done a lot of work at New York Stage and Film. And I had introduced myself at Benefits to say what a fan I was. And we had a mutual friend. And then his wife, I had met who was a fan and, Jessica, um, yeah, she's great. 
Yeah. I mean, was it like a total, would you do this? Yes. How did you decide to seek partnership with these people that you, did you just admire them and you're like, look, I want you on this project or what led you to them? Well, it was different performers for different songs that I could hear in my head. Now, the best story is Molly Gordon and Colton, the stars of, um, you know, Alice by Heart. Mm -hmm. When Molly Gordon was 14 years old and Ben Platt was 16 years old and I knew them and I loved them, I was creating a musical with Burt Backrock. And I thought I should give these guys roles they can play when they grow up. So I named the characters Ben and Molly. Four actors play two characters who are called Ben and Molly. Then the first song in the show is called Molly. So Molly had been, when she was 14 or 15, hearing Kyle Riopko sing this song in a workshop in L.A. And I think she was so embarrassed by it. We, we, we had committed to doing couples. So Ben and Molly, Ben Platt and Molly remained kind of best friends, but they had never been on stage together in New York, despite having done a million musicals together as kids. So I thought of Colton, whom I am in love with. He's amazing. And he was amazing in Alice by Heart. And so I asked them and they said, Molly was shooting a movie and a TV project. And they both, again, they both said, yes, Colton was quarantined and he was um, between, Colton was in Kentucky, in his home in Kentucky, and he had to put styrofoam all over, tape it to the walls of his room so that he could record the song. And he engineered his own song. Wow. Um, hmm. So that was, and then Molly came in later and recorded over him. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, 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 I guess it, like Jennifer Holiday, I thought, oh, my God, she would just destroy the song. She destroys would everything. she do it? And I had worked <laughs> with Jennifer years before. And she did destroy the song. And we recorded that in person. And she held my hand. Aww. When she was listening to playbacks, she was the consummate professional perfectionist I, I which i love and by the way bert and i share that too like there's no limit to how far how hard you'll work on something she did it over and over can i add vocals at the ending can i would you want to hear that would you want i mean the loveliest but also so committed and she knocked it out of the park it's astonishing what she did it's super it's super cool to me to, to think and, and a lot of people don't kind of realize this is I didn't realize how many years you had been working on this with Bert, right? So you said it was 2016 I think was the first uh concert. No, the first no the first um we began work on this in 2010, Alan. Wow. wow. Okay. So so then this yeah. is in parallel to how many other projects, right? Like you've got Alice by Heart, the stage production, and then you're turning it into a mm -hmm. novel. And you've got mm -hmm. so many other things that you are writing and working on all at the same time. And so w what is, I guess, what is the chance? What are, what are the intentions you are taking to kind of shift between what you're focusing on at any given time? I just have to stay very focused on the thing I'm on at any moment, because I'm carrying so many things for so many years, for better or worse, you know, I, I mean, I'm relentless. And for better or worse, I've had the fortune that things have not happened easily or quickly for me ever. So <laughs> <laughs> everything becomes, I mean, Spring Awakening, as you know, was eight years. Yeah. Um, then we did it in London, and I imported changes, which I'm seeing now again, which were not part of our Broadway reunion concert because Michael Mayer thought we should do it just as we had done it. I'm making further changes, which may not become part of the future, but in for this London production, there are changes we've implemented. Krista Rodriguez was at the show last night and she said she almost had heart seizure when she heard one thing that happened. <laughs> I mean, she loved it, but it was like she was in shock. Um, so, but but that was... You know, Alice by Heart, I think, was has been, well, we began that in 2009. And after the New York premiere, the reason we have lots and lots of requests come in to do Alice by Heart, and we always say no because we want to work on it again. So that's not done. Some Lovers is not done. I have... I have three new musicals, three musicals with Duncan that have been in the works for years. I have two with James Bourne that have been in the works for many years. I I don't know if it's good or bad, but I, again, after I finally had some success with, or, or some, you know, great productions with um, Spring Awakening, I was offered a lot of properties by producers and they, they just were never things I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
again, for better or worse, I have all these projects that don't have brand names, that don't have movie studios behind them, you know, as, as, as musicals. And it's uphill, and I, I see things in an unusual way. Some Lovers is such an eccentric musical. Um, the way it works, it, the way it tells its story in and out of time. It's like a Proustian musical that goes back and forth. And Ben and Molly, their younger selves, visit them on a Christmas Eve when they want nothing to do more to do with each other. And, and their younger selves are still, the younger parts of themselves are still in love with each other. And they have this objective to get them back together. And so you go in and out of time. It's almost like betrayal. You know Harold Pinter's play. Mm -hmm. So um, none of them has been an easy ride. I guess that's what I would say. But the rewards are greater for me. Oh yeah, artistically, I mean, creatively. There's so much coming to Broadway these days that are backed by, and nothing against these shows or these organizations. But you have your Disney theatricals, and you've got your your Warner Brothers theatricals, and so many mm -hmm. big, big name, big studios with huge budgets that can afford to to just kind of take their time and do it and throw lots of money at things and, yeah. and lose money mm -hmm. because they've got so much else, uh, so much, so many other things that are in the works or are making money. So like to, to keep like the, uh, the, the, I want to say the mom and popness of, of, mm. or, or the mom and momness <laughs> of the pop and popness <laughs> of, of theater mm. alive. Mm. Uh, in it, the stuff that you create, Stephen is so unique in its, mm. in its, it, it, I, I was going to say format, but I, I don't know what it is. It's just like when I hear your work, when I see your work, mm. I can tell that it is crafted with with so much love and intention behind mm. it versus mm. just money and mm. timeline. Yeah. I mean, for better or worse, I, I just see things in my own way. Yeah. And then I want to see them done you know, in a certain way. And I don't mean that I have to man, like I had no idea that Rupert Gould, I've been working with him throughout the entire pandemic on um, this production of Spring Wake. And I showed up and I was stunned by things he did. So I, I don't mean that I'm controlling as far as the staging, I'm not. But I have, you know, ideas about the kind of musical I wanna create and yeah. I discover on the way and I find great, bedmates you know to <laughs> climb in with me it's pushing boundaries and, that's what it is it's you're not yeah. afraid to push boundaries and, or, and, or afraid of yeah. rejection i don't think like you just feel very no. comfortable with what you're putting out there yeah i mean it's awful to be rejected it's awful that you know i turned down a major film to work on my show murder at the gates with james Bourne to keep working on it and we had such and, we, and here we years later I look back and think, shit, I, my whole career would be in a different place if I'd said yes to this thing. But it's not about my career. I, I want to I, I, murder the gates. I have something I want to say. And I think that, the, you know, I want to talk about what it is to be a Trump era kid of privilege. Mm -hmm. And so I want to write about that. It's like, yeah. oh, like almost like a contemporary spring awakening about how kids are messed. So. I feel committed to the issues, you know, and yes, to the thank you. artistic drive and to trying to change things. You sit watching Spring Awakening now and the issues sadly haven't changed a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. youth suicide is like is called the pandemic within the pandemic. Look at what's happening with abortion rights in the United States right now. They're completely under siege. So I feel proud that we have this statement of what we believe that's going on stage every night well um, that sort of what makes you what your your properties your intellectual properties that you're creating i think the chance that you were taking to find you're just like finding the niche within the niche within the niche to craft these stories that then become so widely not generalized I, I i guess widely um appropriate right because you look at something like a spring awakening and it's uh, a very specific adaptation of a very specific group of kids in a very specific place, but yet the issues that they are dealing with is something, as you just said, that even plus a hundred years later, after the time frame when it's set in, it's still completely relevant right now. That's what I mean. It's really about trying to get to the underlying, like to get to the matter at hand of what's really going on in our culture and address it. I think so many people discovered 
Alice by heart over the pandemic because it's all about being quarantined. Yeah, yeah. it's all about. In, I, for, I, did you both see the production? It you know these kids ran on in masks. Yeah, they ran into tube station. The boy was quarantined and taken away. S- no one wanted War, to be near World War Two, right? Yeah. yeah, and they were trapped in this tiny like they were locked down. Hmm. And they had to, they had only their imaginations as the place to go and try and stop time. And she was losing a friend. How many of us lost people we were close to over the course of this pandemic? So it's, it's you're getting to issues that are real recurring issues. They're, they're like evergreen issues in, in our society. So that, that's what I'm drawn to. I've never been one to... I don't like Let Me Entertain You. It just it turns me <laughs> off when I watch it. I like that song a lot. Don't get me wrong. I like that musical. But, but I'm saying it's just never been my intention as an artist, yeah. to, as a writer, to Did you, merely do that. Have you always found that current affairs or current events, these types of things, inform your creativity? Or is it has that also been you know kind of chance? I think it's been that I... Um, you know, when I, I'm going back to something, which I talked to you about before, Alan, but when I had my accident, you know, when I was 20, mm-hmm. and I was laid up for all those months in hospital, um, I, was, I was on a striker frame, which is like an ironing board. It was turned every two hours from my back to my you know, stomach. And I had, a, I had a page turner I could turn with my teeth. And I was teaching myself ancient Greek because I wanted to see how things last. I wanted to create work that could endure. And one um, night. Oh, you would also turn the pages with a pencil in your mouth, right? Yeah, I had a, it was like a pencil. It was a um, page turner made from a pencil. It had an eraser on the yes, end so that yes. I could use the eraser to, to push the, cha- cha- the page. page. Mm-hmm. The pages were in like brads, like clamps on each side so that I could take it out with the eraser by, you know, pushing my head. Oh, just wow. There was a nun one night. And I don't know that there were always nuns, but this night it was a nun, so I'm addressing chance. It was 4 a.m. I remember it vividly. And I, she was turning me from my back to my stomach. I remember that too vividly. I remember her stockings and her shoes. She said to me when I, she said, you know, God saved you for a reason. Mm. And it just shivered through my whole body. It was like I shook. And I thought, it, I, you know, and I'm a Buddhist now, but even then I was not a particularly, you know, God fearing, per- you know, God was not a major. Mm-hmm. I, I believe in destiny, yeah, and the ways we're talking, like karma, um, and action. Um, so, but it r- really took me. I thought, whoa, I survived, and I have to get it done. I have to make things. I, I don't know. I wanted to create things that could could last, and I think it's not. It's that I see current events. So to go back to your question, I was trying to bring in the chance album, which is part of it. I see current events through a lens of classical culture. Mm. I see it through a lens of history. It's less that I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of what's going on politically and socially, but I, I'm so, but my worldview is more informed by the Iliad or a Greek tragedy, or that's kind of where I live. And so with that, I'm kind of looking for again, better or worse, because I don't mm-hmm. watch TV. I don't, you know, I don't see the news. And so yeah, I, that's but I, 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 I just, I look at things in a certain way. You know, today I had a few hours, I was at the British Museum and I was looking at, you know, 13th century BC, Assyrian gates and inscriptions. And that's, that's like very, that feels like home to me, you know, <laughs> when I'm mm-hmm. looking at things like that. And we we're talking about, I was with a friend talking about the cultural appropriation of these Assyrian ruins and these Egyptian ruins. So I, I certainly have a political mindset, but I think it comes from bringing a classical bent to it. That's what I would say. I love that. And so then I, I may be looking at it at it. I, I don't I mean deeper as a praise, but, but it's, it's like looking at it at a, it, from the I you say in Latin, sub speciae eternitas, looking at it from the aspect of eternity rather than just looking at it from the aspect of the moment you're in. Yeah. So I have a, a a question that is somewhat selfish, but um, I'm very okay. curious and it relates to, relates to the whole chance in the first place. You are extremely successful. You have all these mm-hmm. awards that Heather wonderfully rattled off at the beginning of the episode, <laughs> and it it mm-hmm. 
like the fact that you and I, I believe can call each other. I call you my friend. I feel like we know each other in a way uh, through, through the professionalism of Broadway um, that I don't have. And we have a relationship that I don't have with pretty much anyone else in this industry. Oh. And, and I love you for that. And I want to, I guess my question is like, why, why do you, are you this open with, with anybody? Like, why do you, why do you want to talk with people who, and this could be my own imposter syndrome. About Maybe you're just here. super special, Alan. I don't, why do you, why do you want to, uh, or why do you, how do you spend? Okay. My question, let me rephrase this. How <laughs> do you choose how you spend your time and who you prioritize in your life? Well, I always prioritize my work to to the extent of being off-putting to friends, relations, you know, family, loved ones. I always, I, it's because it came out of that accident, and I'm not blaming it on the accident. I, it's me. I chose that I wanted. I made this determination to create these things that would last, and I felt I have to. So I always privilege working. I always privilege just staying home and writing. I generally don't go out at all on weekends. I, I, you know, the pandemic, um, as awful as it was for everyone and as heartbreaking as it was for me, there were a lot of aspects of it that felt normal because I was just staying home writing. You know how it is. People burrow into your heart and then they live there. And so I, I do my best to make time for those people. So I would say though you said it so sweetly and so kindly, I would say I can be rather inept at it, but I do my best um, to <laughs> I mean, make that's time the for the people do. who have dented <laughs> my heart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so speaking from, from my own personal experience here, like the fact that, that we have kept in touch, the, the chance that you are taking as adults, right? We take chances because our time is stretched everywhere, especially if we have children, which all of us do. And, and, when we're being pulled in so many different places, we're always trying to take chances and prioritize what's important. So I, I think personally, I just want to take a moment and thank you for taking a chance on making a new uh -huh. friend because you didn't need one. I don't think you needed a new friend, but now you've got one, whether you like it or not. Uh -huh. I want in. <laughs> 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 Heather, you are here. Uh -huh. you, yes, we're all friends now. Uh -huh. You know, there's the guy, I travel, I eat oddly, you know, I eat like in this organic diet, vegan diet, and I would not want my food to get x-rayed at airports, which is like a, tr a dicey thing to pull through in security, you know, right now. But mm -hmm. there was this guy, Rob, who often worked at, um, you know, at Delta. He was, he would be the guy and Rob and I just became friends and he wanted me to know about his daughter and his daughter in LA, and he would like stay in touch with me. I don't know, I, I guess um, people touch you and people, you know, Alan, part of it was the way you saw me, mm. the way you talked to me, what you understood about me. And that moved me so much. And so then, I don't know, I guess when you feel loved by someone in a certain way, that touches you in a certain way. I guess that's what I would say. And so this guy, Rob, at the airport, he retired. And he stayed in touch with me. I love that. And, you know, and I just felt like the pain in the ass. It was always saying, you know, <laughs> would, do we have to x-ray my vegan burritos? You know what I mean? But would, Stephen, I, mean, I, I see that show up in your work. What what you said, uh, to rephrase it a little, is um, when when you're touched by something, when you feel connected, then magic happens. And that's what I think you do with your work. And it's mm. such a gift. Well, I don't thank you. I don't know. I don't know. I know I, I, I feel like there's stories I have to tell and I get driven to them. And then I, I can't let go of them till I feel like they're told. That's, that's beautiful. That's, that is an artist and that is taking a chance on life. Stephen, thank you so much. You've given us so much of your time. And of course, when you could be hanging out with your with cousin your and seeing British yeah. museums. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, well. Thank you for oh, joining us from across thank the you. pond. It's such a pleasure. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. Good luck more with, than I can tell you. The Grammys. I can't wait to. I've never. I don't watch thank the Grammys, you. but I'm going to watch because you're going to win and I'm going to cheer. Oh, my God. From your <laughs> lips. Thank you. <laughs> yeah thank you so much thank you both so 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 much for making time you're Absolutely. very welcome 
and we're recording again. 25,000 tracks in this one interview recording session. 25,000, 25,000, 25,000. <laughs> wow. What a man. What a career. <laughs> what eyes. It's, it's like my my mind is blown. Right? Like he is he is so successful and so high level of of a professional individual, right? <laughs> but he makes himself so accessible that that I, I count myself lucky. Every time I get a text from that man or he just responds to one of mine, I'm like, I am so lucky that that he is just this dude that wants to to make other people as great as he is. He is such a great guy. Yeah. Man. Well, one of the things that we talked about after we finished recording, which I was like, man, I can't believe we don't have this recorded, was how he has launched the careers of so many incredible artists, actors, by casting them in, in his shows yeah. at a young age. Yeah. Everything that he's, that he's written that people are in just to tur turn out, as he was saying, like the original cast of Spring Awakening, the original London yeah. cast of Spring Awakening, and then now this revival that he's doing in London right now as we're recording. Um, he was telling the story that these big casting directors and movie producers walked out the other night, literally like a night or two ago, and were like, I want all these kids. These kids are great. That's and amazing. they are kids right now. And so just what he was talking about taking the chance of turning down big budget turning down big collaboration for time and money he focuses on the story he focuses on the content and when it's ready content wise then he puts it out and so that carries into what you see on stage and just brings it out at a level so much higher than it would have been if it was just this big studio, big budget studio sort of thing. So cool. And it's so special. And I am just in love. I When I published my first book, somebody said, you have to make sure you take a copy of it with you everywhere you go and when you travel, because you never know when you're going to want to pull out your book and say, no, here, take this copy or here, I've got this. And as he was sharing his stories of not once, but twice being in a room with Bert Backrack, and he said, well, when you when you have some music to share, it seems like, oh, oh, here, I have it right here. I've just brought it with me. Oh, here's my lyrics. Bert, here's some, here here's some lyrics, lyrics that I just carry no around. No problem. You know, um, the brilliancy of that. I mean, obviously, it's 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 intentional creation. You're going to sit down, go to a meeting with Bart Backrack. You might want to take your lyrics. But also just, <laughs> you know, having those things ready to go and, and ready to create at a moment's notice. So cool. He's he's just a great guy, and you're gonna meet him in person one day. So I can't you, wait. Yeah, next time you come to New York, we'll we'll set up a, a we'll threesome, threesome date. It'll um, be fun. Yeah, but everybody, please check out some lovers. The concept album, of course, Grammy nominated between yeah. by Bert Grant. <laughs> Check out Some Lovers, this concept album, Grammy nominated now, this collaboration between Burt Bacharach and Steven Sater. Just, it's so phenomenal. The names we didn't read, Ariel Satchel, Colton Ryan, Conrad Ricamora, Graham Phillips, Ashley Park, Laura Osnes, Leah Michelle, Katrina Lank, Derek Kleina. God, the the list of people that he has gotten for this album are phenomenal. Can You've we put the whole list in the show notes? Sure. With some link backs for people? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll do that. Hey, we want to hear, all of you, our listeners, we want to hear about your experience with chance, with intentional creation, with manifestation. And so you can text us, you can DM us through Instagram. We are was it chance on Instagram. And there's a very good possibility if you share your story with us that we are going to read your story aloud and share it as a little special snippet of the show. So be sure to do that. Follow us. We want you to subscribe because you you definitely do not want to miss any episodes of this podcast because they are fucking phenomenal. <laughs> uh, if we do say so ourselves. If we do say so ourselves. They're so much fun. I actually really still love to re-listen to them. They just make me laugh. My partner's like, didn't weren't you there live? 
Like, why is that so funny? I'm like, it's so funny. It's a different <laughs> mode. So it's a different <laughs> mode. When you're in it and thinking of the questions and actively listening, you're yeah. not paying attention to no. the full picture. Well, well, I am paying attention to the full picture. I take that back. But listening back to it as an audience member when it's you don't different. have the pressure of having to talk. Yeah. Yeah, it's completely different. It's so fun. And do us a favor and uh, rate and review yeah. the podcast. It matters. And also, it just makes us feel good because it's really fun <laughs> to see those reviews. It's good for our egos. Right, Alan? Yes, and boy, do we have fragile egos. No, just or you. Not, or not. He's the, Alan's the only one with the fragile It depends. Ego. If I really care about somebody, what you say really matters. But if I, yeah. but the majority of the world, okay. we know. care. Listen, listen. If you're listening to this show, we care what you have to say about it. Listen, where I practice building up thick skin is YouTube comments. That's where I go. Ooh. YouTube comments are the worst. We're really glad you were here. Thanks for listening to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. I'm Alan Seals. We'll talk to you soon. 